Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Congressman Fletcher, for taking time out of your demanding schedule to join the Texas legal community in their celebration of 50 years. Uh, my name is Maria Thomas-Jones, and I'm the CEO of Legal Aid of Northwest Texas in the Fort Worth area. And it is my honor to introduce today our colleague, Jan Edgar Lang Langby, today's keynote speaker. Uh, for 32 years, Jan has been an activist in efforts to end violence against women, currently serving as the CEO of Genesis Women's Shelter and Support based in Dallas, Texas. She is recognized as a national expert on the dynamics and effects of domestic violence and has spoken at numerous events locally, statewide, and at the national level. Jan provides expert testimony in court cases and trains law enforcement and prosecutorial professionals to enhance their efforts to end violence against women. And she has served as, the as a presidential appointee and a senior policy advisor to the director of the United States Department of Justice Office on Violence Against Women. We are so grateful for the opportunity to learn from her today. And she is a feisty advocate. She is a fabulous person. And her, she has trained thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people um, to be able to provide legal services and services altogether for survivors of domestic violence. And so I introduce my friend, uh, Jan Langbein. Good afternoon. It is such an honor to be here with you guys today. I'm probably maybe 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 the biggest fan of Legal Services uh, Corporation and the work that you do because at Genesis I get to see firsthand the miracles that happen when there is uh, civil legal representation. You know, as I, I stand here and I look around the room, I see men and women of leadership and accomplishment. Uh, an achievement, but I, I really do feel that if we are to elite, if we are to lead and achieve, then we must remove the roadblocks. We have the opportunity, but also the obligation to remove roadblocks that keep other people from leading and achieving. Roadblocks like poverty, roadblocks like homelessness and hopelessness, roadblocks like domestic violence. About 10 years ago, there was a movie uh, called The Emperor's Club, starring actor Kevin Klein. He was a professor of classical literature at an all boys uh, preparatory school. And in one of the classes, he was talking about the reign of King Shutruk Ahunte, who was king of the Elamites in 1500 BC. And there was even a plaque up there talking in the classroom, talking about his great achievements and his conquests of lands and riches and wives. And he speaks of his great wealth. But the kids in the class, the young boys in the class started talking about, this guy is so famous and he's so amazing. Why have we never heard of him? And uh, Mr. Hunter, the, the teacher said, he answered this question with these words, great ambition and conquest with great, without contribution is without significance. Great ambition and conquest without great contribution is without significance. And that's what I'm here today to talk to you all about. What is your significance? You come from all over Texas, all over the country, uh, from different cultures, and it, but by the very work you do, I can stand here and tell you that I know you're loyal, that you're compassionate, that you're thoughtful, that you're determined, uh, and you are responsible. In the Declaration of Independence, it says liberty and justice for all. Not liberty and justice as long as you can pay 300 bucks an hour. It's not liberty and justice uh, as long as you don't vacillate back and forth be between stopping and starting those proceedings all over again. It doesn't say liberty and justice uh, it says liberty and justice for all. Creating legal aid offices all across this country, you have been helping to provide that liberty and that justice, and I applaud you for that. But I also challenge you to do more, to be professionally and personally significant. 
So this work that you do, this, this, um, this work that you do cannot just be a stack of vanilla folders on your desk. It's not just the burdening number of cases that you have. This is what I mean. Let's say I walk into your office and I, I'm halfway in tears and I say to you, I need a divorce, but I don't know how to go about it. I don't know what to do next. I left my husband a week ago. I don't have any money. I have three children. What I'm not telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is last Saturday night, he put his hands around my throat and he was gonna kill me. I don't know why he stopped. I don't know why he let go. Um, I don't know why he let me live that night. But the truth is, he didn't want to kill me. He wanted to show that he could kill me at any time he wanted to. You know, I went to the police, but the um, color of my skin, because of, because of the color of my skin, the bruises on my neck didn't show. But my hidden bruises were my dizziness and my fogginess and my headaches. And I had difficulty swallowing. And my speech uh, was... Um, was hoarse and gruff, but I kept hearing his words in my head, that's the hidden damage, is the words in his head that he said, if I ever tried to leave him, he would hunt me down and he would kill me. So since that last week, Saturday night, I have felt invisible, I have felt unseen, I have felt, felt unheard, I have been failed by systems that were meant to protect me, justice systems, and uh, justice seems elusive at every single turn, from the hospital to the police station to court. Um, so I'm going to ask you, will you be the one pulling me from this wreckage of domestic violence? Um, you see, that changes everything for you guys. That changes everything about this divorce. That information that I just gave you changes what custody ought to look like and what separation ought to look like and what your safety concerns in your courtroom ought to look like. Uh, and by the way, I just want to tell you this, if there is just a check mark on your intake form, are you safe at home, or did your partner hurt you or hit you, you're, you're, I'm not going to check yes. Um, I don't know who you are. I don't know if you can help me. I don't know if I'm, I'm a t I, and I am terrified that he's going to keep that promise that he said he would hunt me down and kill me. Uh, or he would go to court, like some of our panelists said earlier, he'd go to court with a suit and a tie on, and he'd look across from his hot and cold running legal team, defense team, and he would call me a drunk and he would call me a whore and he would say, I'm unfit to be a parent and I would lose my children because he told me it was my fault. He told me that if I, sm I cried less and smiled more or if I could be a Proverbs 31 wife that he would not have to treat me this way. See, this is all very critical information that you need to know as attorneys. Uh, if you are going to help me, um, but with, the, with my case, what are you going to ask me and how are you going to ask me so that I don't just give you a flat no. I was doing uh, speaking at Grand Rounds at a large area hospital in Dallas not long ago, and I was going through the dynamics of domestic violence, the cycle of violence and all the things, the myths around it. And I asked them in this family uh, medical clinic that they had that day, uh, do you ask? Do you ask every patient? Because as they were saying earlier, one out of every three women in Texas will be uh, will know domestic violence. Domestic violence is the leading cause of injury to women in the United States. Do you ask about that when you are checking me in? The nurse said, absolutely, absolutely. I, we ask everybody. But there's the weird thing is nobody has said yes. And all the times we've been asking, not one person has said yes. And I'm like, okay, let's Let's talk about that. She goes, I think it's weird that we don't have any survivors of domestic violence. I'm like, really? I think it's weird that you don't know that you have many survivors of domestic violence. But I said, when do you ask her? Just when? And she said, well, you know, we call her up to the kiosk and we, you know, uh, put a bracelet on her arm and we ask him for the insurance cards. And I'm like, okay, you ask him for the insurance cards. He's sitting right there. What do you think she is going to say? Um, and even, even if you ask me point blank, I don't know, even if he wasn't there, I doubt I would tell you yes right off the bat. So I went to a new doctor the other day. You're, you're always going to have to forgive me this story, but went to a new doctor the other day and they hand me a clipboard. And on the clipboard, it's like, do you smoke? No. Do you exercise? No. Do you, um, you know, what's your, how many surgeries have you had? How many, you know, have you fallen lately? And then they asked me, um, am I sexually active? Am I sexually active? Well, I looked around that room and I thought, I don't know these people and I don't know this receptionist and I don't know this nurse. So you know what I said? Yes. Oh my gosh, I'm 74 and I'm like rabbits. I mean, Steve and I, 
Yeah, it's all the time, everywhere. And I'm thinking, oh, you're so stupid. But so what happens is, like I say, the receptionist sees that. It's the most personal thing that you could ask me. What do you expect me to say? Am I safe in my own home? I'm not going to tell you about that. So basically what I bring you here today is how you uh, and your, you can help your clients live abuse-free. I want you to protect the promises that you make uh, for uh, LSC and for access to justice. So when I, and I, this is how I'm gonna help you help them. So when I first started in this field, we operated on what's called a medical model. A medical model, uh, we, and Emily, you're too young to know this, okay? But when we started out, women would come and they'd say, I can't eat, I can't sleep, and I cry all the time. And I'd say, okay, great, I've got three pills. Here's one, go get your protective order. Here's another one, go get you an apartment. Here's another one, go get you a job. And she would and come back and see me in a week. She'd come back and she'd say, well, I have a job, I have an apartment, and I have a uh, protective order but I can't eat, I can't sleep, and I cry all the time. So we were asking things like, well, did he hit you? Did he punch you? Did he burn you? Did he scald you? Uh, did he shave your head? Did he stab you? On and on. But you know what we weren't asking is how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And this is this trauma approach. Yes, you need to ask all those things to get you know your ducks in a row on her case, but um, we, we should have been asking not, what has he done, but how does that make you feel? You know what she's gonna say? She says, I'm scared, and I'm humiliated, and I'm embarrassed, and I'm betrayed, and you know what, I'm so stupid that I don't know how I let this happen to me. And we begin at that point to walk beside her, not lead her into the justice system, but walk beside her, uh, and, and that's what can make a difference. Um, with a trauma-informed approach, you'll be able to understand why she does not present well in court, why she wants to vacillate between, I want a divorce, I don't want a divorce, I want a divorce, I can't get a divorce. Uh, and you know, it's so easy, again, for us to judge and say, lady, just let me know when you want one, I've got another manila file folder on my desk, right? Um, okay, so all of that's gonna start making sense if you'll understand a trauma-informed approach. Now, let's say me, the real Jan Langbein, walks into your office and I want a divorce after 54 years of marriage because I'm so sick and tired about how loudly he eats his cereal. That's all hypothetical, right, girls, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, and I'm sure he's sick of me crying about how loudly he eats his cereal. But my procedure is, it, that's gonna be uh, really different from the lady I just mentioned to you. Uh, but over and above, the legal knowledge, the knowledge of the legal procedures, where there is violence in that relationship, this is where your legal practice can become significant. Understanding the prevalence of domestic violence, the dynamics of domestic violence, the danger of homes where there's domestic violence. When he, and also, the panelists were talking about that, when he no longer can hit me or hurt me, he becomes, uh, his choice of weapon becomes manipulation of the court system. So, um, According to Lundy Bancroft, and any other social workers in the room know exactly who I'm talking about, he's worked with men who battle for just years and years and years. Uh, and he says where there is c contested custody, the majority of those cases have abuse in that home. Where there are firearms, those the presence, the mere presence of firearms spark a divorce proceeding, uh, uh, a divorce proceeding can spark into um, something that can explode. And, and again, speaking of firearms, please, please follow that uh, Rahimi case. We are desperate to get those clauses back in if convicted of a felony of domestic violence, if subject to a protective order. I don't know how they weren't thinking about that. I really don't. So um, we know, again, they talked about it earlier that you know women are in more danger. And so by the, I really want you to hear, because a lot of times this is where a lot of people just turn off old Jan, because I'm, I'm not against your Second Amendment rights. I'm really not. I mean, I'm okay with guns I, as long as you uh, are, should have them and it's legal for you to, ha to have them. But I go on these rants and raves every time there's, you know, another homicide with firearms and, you know, the press comes and says, well, what do you say when somebody says you're trying to destroy my First Amendment rights? I say, this is a really easy answer. Super easy. Don't beat your wife. Don't be a creep. Don't hurt somebody else. And you can have all the guns you want, right? Um, I just don't understand how it goes from let's protect families 
to I'm trying to destroy somebody's uh, Second Amendment rights. So how do you, how, how can you make a difference? How do you become uh, trauma-informed? And I know you're sitting there thinking, I am a lawyer, I am not a social worker, but <laughs> if you want to protect the promises, you're gonna have to wear that social worker's hat just a little bit. What is trauma-informed? Trauma-informed is being very careful with your choice of words, okay? Now, I'm gonna, oh, I forgot my timer. I didn't start it because I get going and I can't stop. <laughs> but I'm just gonna take a few more minutes because a huge professional aha uh -uh for me was when I discovered a, a study by a guy named Francesca, and he, he did the trans-theoretical model of change. He says if you want to change anything in your life, there are five distinct stages. Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance, okay? Pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. He was talking, his study was about the cessation of smoking. Um, I'm going to use it in terms of exercising uh, because I've never been a smoker. Actually, I've never been an exerciser, but I get the concept of exercising. I don't understand smoking. But anyway, uh, so if you think in terms of most of the people who we see at Genesis or at Hawk, they are in pre-contemplation. They hadn't thought, they've grabbed their babies and run out the door. So if you get with them and start saying, let's get a divorce, let's get a protective order, here's your case, we're gonna meet on this day, she sees your mouth moving, but she has no idea what you're saying, right? Contemplation is, Gosh, I wonder what it would be like if my children didn't cry themselves to sleep at night. I wonder what it would be like if I were not scared in my own home. Preparation is maybe they look up Hawk on uh, the website, uh, or maybe they make a call to the National Domestic Violence Hotline just to kind of get some more information. Um, action doesn't necessarily mean that they went to Hawk. Action means they can name it and claim it. That's a real hard one to get to. They can name it and claim it. It was not my fault. It was not my fault. Um, and stop asking me why I don't leave. Ask him why he did it in the first place, right? So um, that's action. Uh, and then maintenance is um, he's, you know, I, I'm an exerciser for life, right? Um, which I don't know that I could ever get to. My husband's an exerciser for life. He'll come to a hotel and go to the gym. But here's the thing. If I, if I am kind of going through these stages and I do go back, rather than you judge me, know that if you did your job and I do my job, they're not gonna go all the way back to pre-contemplation. Anyway, there's, I could do a whole lecture on, on Prochesca, but it was super important to me to realize, not as, only as an employer, but you have to be able to speak to someone in the stage in which they are, okay? Like I can't talk to somebody in, pre, in pre-contemplation hurry up and get out. But you know what I can do? Not only do you need to identify the stage that she's in, you also can help move her to the next one. Hey, what do you think this is doing to your kids? How safe do you feel? Do you know there's a national domestic violence hotline 24 hours a day? That can help move her to the next stage. Again, I know you're thinking, I'm not a social worker. It will make a difference in your law firm. I promise you that. Uh, another way to be trauma-informed beside your just choice of words is your, your tone. You know, what is your body language? Are you hovering over her or are you, does she recognize you as someone who is there to hurt her, uh, help her, not hurt her? Uh, body language, stressing confidentiality. You know this goes no further, right? It's not just, hey, you're sexually active. It goes no further than right here. This is between you and me and it's privilege. Um, of course, without judgment or bias. If you think, gosh, she should have left the last time, then you're not the right lawyer for her. You have to understand why she's still there. And this one's gonna make you laugh. And I know you're gonna say, have you ever seen the offices at Legal Aids? And by the way, yes, I have. I've worked down there. Uh, but I, it'd be great if you could have a soft interview room for these women. We have actually put an occupational therapeutic sensory room on site at Genesis. Because of the trauma, because what they've gone through, we have a safe place for women to be able to tell their stories in a safe place where children can um, uh, re-regulate again. Uh, but anyway, this is my gift to you, um, is that if you want to know more about a trauma-informed approach, Genesis in our new non-residential center uh, has a national training center on crimes against women, which stretches our national conference on crimes against women, the largest conference in uh, America on uh, crimes against women, and that starts in May. But, uh, we have this training center, and on February the 27th, if you're interested in this, they are gonna be doing trauma-informed training for attorneys, and I absolutely can give you a link to that before I leave today. 
um, how you can sign up and register for that. But it's lawyers and legalese and all the things that you need to know about, um, but in a trauma-informed approach. So this summer, uh, February 26, all eyes are going to be on Paris, France with the uh, opening of the Olympic Games. And you'll see the torch come by all the way from Greece. And in early Greece, actually, uh, the Olympic Games were not judged as they are today. Obviously, today it's the fastest time, it's the jump the farthest, it's run the longest. Um, but uh, we, the, when they first started, back then, the definition of winners was everyone who crossed the finish line with their torches still lit. Anybody who crosses the finish line with their torches still lit. Each of us, again, has that opportunity, uh, an obligation to help those who cannot help themselves. And it is with your help and those who hurt that um, they can find safety. And in doing so, your torch will shine brighter, it will stay lit, and you will show someone else the way. Thank you for being a hero in Legal Services Corporation. Thank you for wanting to make a difference in the lives of others. Thank you so much for having me today.